Throughout Paul's epistle to the Galatians, he's been talking about salvation as if it was an experience, something that deeply entered into a person's soul and completely transformed them. Now he's going to say, here's how you can tell if it's happened. The second half or the last part of Paul's epistle to the Galatians is all about the practical implications, that is the imperatives, the things that you must now do because of what you know. And Paul is going to contrast those who claim to be Christians and yet have not had a transforming conversion experience with the Holy Spirit as people who live according to the flesh, that is, the carnal, sinful, selfish desires that are present in a person before the Holy Spirit has transformed them by the presence of Christ. And then he's going to say, but here's how you can tell if someone really has been transformed. Let's have a look at it. We're picking it up in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. So here Paul is saying, once you have been born again, an experience that the Holy Spirit does in a person that makes them a Christian. You see, you can't claim to be a Christian just because you know the truth. The truth being that we are all lost, alienated, cut off from God, estranged from Him, and we need to be reconciled. We need to come in confession of our guilt, shame, and sin and ask for His forgiveness that He offers. And that happens when the Holy Spirit puts that into us. And then when we do that, the Holy Spirit gives us the gift of repentance. That is a change of heart, a change of mind, and a change of actions. That process that happens in the transformation of a believer is called generally sanctification. In one sense, there's a legal term. Uh, the Bible uses this legal term to talk about sanctification. We were this, we are now this. But in a practical outworking, our lives are being conformed, being conformed, into the image and likeness of Christ. That's what we refer to as sanctification. Paul says the person who lives with their sinful, selfish desires is going to resist that work of the Holy Spirit. But when a person receives the Holy Spirit in a work of salvation, that salvation gift causes a person to have a change of desires. They want to do what the Holy Spirit leads them to do. Let's have a look now at what Paul says are the hallmarks of someone who has indeed been transformed by the Holy Spirit. But if you are led by the Spirit, verse 18, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Notice this, notice the first three of these indeed. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality. These things are all have to do with some of the basest desires and lusts of the human heart. Sex is such a powerful thing, but it needs to be harnessed in the same way that a fire in a home can achieve warmth or it can burn the house down. <laughs> that fire needs to be contained within the fireplace. And so sex, sex and it's our sexuality, our sex drive needs to be harnessed according to to the law of God, according to God's design for it. And so the first three things that Paul mentions as sinful works of the flesh are all sexual things. He then goes on and lists idolatry, sorcery, enmity. Now, I just want to pause there because we, if you've gone through the daily Bible readings through the entire Bible, what we did, we saw that whenever the Bible talks about idolatry, 
it automatically links sexual immorality in with that. And Paul's just now done that. He's listed three aspects of sexual immorality and then straight away launched into idolatry. These are the sinful things. And the interesting thing is that in pagan worship, there were often drug-induced uh, hypnotic drugs, so to speak, that drive a person into a, a spiritual consciousness. The interesting thing about this is that the word sorcery, which we might associate with witchcraft, is the Greek word pharmakeia, where we get the word pharmaceuticals from. Just an interesting point. The other things that we see here, now these are bad, these sins are bad, but now notice the other things that Paul lists as works of the flesh that are also just as equally bad. And they all relate to how we interact with other people. So notice this, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies. And then Paul says this, and things like these. Now, Paul has a strong warning here. We need to tell the truth to people about these things because Paul says, I warn you as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So let's be under no illusion that these things are not that big a deal. Someone's sexuality outside of the bounds of biblical sexuality could mean that they will not inherit the kingdom of God, that is right standing with God and eternal life. But now notice this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. Notice all these, they go straight to the heart of how we interact with other people. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So notice the hallmark of someone who has been transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit is how they interact with others. And the first thing Paul lists is love. And love is ultimately serving another person for their highest good. It also means being patient with someone. It means that we don't speak ill of them, even though they may have hurt us or offended us. <laughs> this is all fruit of the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit puts that desire into a person. Perhaps you're struggling with some of these things. Notice what Paul is saying and the way he is saying it. These things are designed by God's Word, God's Spirit, who's put this in here, not, not to beat us up, because that would be counted to the entire point of Galatians, but to urge us to do the right thing, to hear the wooing of the Spirit of God. So if you're someone who is struggling with these things, let's heed what Paul is saying now and invite the Holy Spirit to come into our life, your life, and to transform you. Perhaps you've never had that experience of conversion. You may feel you're too far gone. If only God knew what you were doing. Well, let me tell you, he does. He does know what you've been doing. And he offers to forgive you. He offers to redeem you, set you free, and give you a brand new life. You're not a million miles away from God. You're just one prayer away right now. And you can pray a prayer, a prayer that says, God, please forgive me. Please come into my life and help me now to live for you. I need the Holy Spirit whom Paul has been talking about. You pray a prayer like that, I guarantee you, your life will be different. Your life will be changed. And now as Paul is beginning to connect the dots, this is what it means to be saved and made right with God. And then he said, it impacts how you treat others. To treat others with an expression of just your lust and sexual desire is to treat them as an object, not as a human being. And then when Paul says the fruit of the Spirit begins with love, joy, peace and patience, that are, that are 
the, the essence of, of how we are to interact with each other. That's what we were designed to do. Let's pray. Father, for those perhaps who feel that they haven't quite attained to the life of the Spirit, to walk in the Spirit, to be able to heed the voice of the Spirit and the leading of the Spirit, grant them that grace now, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. If you haven't yet given this a thumbs up, please do. Hit the notification bell and please become a subscriber. I really appreciate those who have subscribed recently. And we'll be back to talk about more implications as we dig deeper into Paul's epistle to the Galatians.